So my name is Claire. I live in Queens in New York. I'm a proud Queens resident, uh, but I grew up in North Dakota. Um, I've lived in Queens for uh, the last eight years. Before that, I lived in Chicago and LA. And I happened to be in Queens uh, during the pandemic. And uh, in the summer of 2020, in the entire year of 2020, uh, I, like many people, I'm sure, signed up for a lot of online things, doing a lot of stuff online. Um, and prior to signing up for a lot of online things, I was already really bombarded by the outside world, by my email inbox, by social media feeds, and I was really bombarded and angered and overwhelmed by this phrase, these unprecedented times. Because a lot of what we were and are experiencing is not unprecedented. And in particular, when George Floyd was murdered in the summer of 2020, I was really frustrated with talking about that event as being unprecedented because it's not. So one of the ways that I tried to channel my anger was by signing up for more online things. And um, it was at one of these online things that I heard something that changed the way I thought about not just activism and social change, but myself. So this online thing was hosted by two best friends. It was a call in the fall of 2020. Um, and the women who hosted the event are named Aurora Archer and Kelly Croce Sorg. And they are entrepreneurs, writers, podcasters, and they have a company called The Opt-In. And this talk was in preparation for the 2020 election, and it was about talking to people in your life, your friends and family, and having difficult discussions around race. Now, what made these two women very qualified and um, in interesting to listen to um, when it came to this subject is that Aurora is Afro-Latina and Kelly is white. And they had been friends for a long time. But after a certain period of time, these differences between them and how differently they were being treated out in the world, it became too big of a thing to not address with as deep a friendship as they had cultivated. So they started talking about it. And Kelly began reading some books that Aurora had recommended, and it became a relationship where this was a part of their everyday life, talking about systemic racism and white supremacy. And it sounded like it was really difficult. And I did learn a lot from what Kelly said. As a white woman, I resonated with a lot of what she said, but it's what Aurora said that really stuck with me. So Aurora expressed total shock that she learned from her friend Kelly that a lot of white women do not feel that they're good enough. That they don't feel that they have inherent value. That they don't feel they necessarily have worth outside of what they look like whether or not they have kids, what kind of mom they are, how much money they make, what their job is. And she was shocked. She was like, what do you mean you don't love yourselves? How can you judge yourselves so harshly? Everything's made for you. <laughs> you're the ideal mothers and wives and you have the ideal homes and you're portrayed as, as just being like the best of the best. And it didn't make sense to her. She, she said, you're even the ideal voting block. Like, everyone wants to know what you want and what you think. Everyone courts a white woman, uh, especially in today's market. Now, respect is a whole different thing, right? But idolization has its value. And so they began speaking about that and about how to build inherent feelings of self-worth and self-love. And at first, I 
I kind of laughed at this. <laughs> I think maybe that was out of defense. I was like, oh yeah, we get it, we all hate ourselves. <laughs> but then Aurora made this big connection that really changed the game for me. And I relate it now to heroism. I believe that heroism starts with loving yourself. Aurora said, if we do not have love for ourselves, if we don't have compassion for ourselves, if we don't value ourselves, how can we expect to extend love and compassion to other people? And suddenly, a lot of the hatred and vitriol I was seeing that was making me so upset made a little more sense to me. And I, I was just, this really hit me. It hit me like nothing has in as long as I can remember. And I was like one of those people on the, you know, on the other end of the Zoom that was like in the chat like this, you know, like standing up, like typing. And as I was having this realization and typing like, oh my gosh, me too, I've never thought about it this way, streams and streams and streams of comments came through the chat. And it seemed like there were hundreds of people on this call. It was a nationwide call. And a lot of them were white women. And it was shocking and also heartening and all sorts of feelings to see that so many other women had had these feelings, either felt that way or had felt that way in the past. So how do we do this? You know, like I've begun to think as I've participated in a lot of activist spaces, both with white communities and people of, of color in their communities, I, I'm not sure that we're taught to love ourselves. And I don't mean whether or not we received love from our parents or from our friends and family when we were growing up. I mean from our society and the larger world that we live in. I know as a woman, for me, I often am comparing myself to people constantly, especially on social media. It's about you know, how much money I make or how I look or what value I can bring to the table for a company or for an organization. So I started thinking about this, like, how can I learn to love myself? And I, I started to realize that, well, I better figure out a way because this thing we've been doing, the punishment and self-hatred and anger is not working. So we have to learn how to do this, loving ourselves, and then spreading that love to other people. So I literally started by looking at myself in the mirror in the morning and at night and saying, I love you. I think you have value and you have worth and you don't have to earn anyone's love or approval. And I've been starting to realize that there are things that I love about myself. <laughs> I, I love my enthusiasm. I love my earnestness. I love my laugh. I love my passion, my pursuit of the truth, my desire to protect other people, even if they don't ask for it, <laughs> um, my desire to support people. I you know, love how much sleep I need. I love how much I like to cook and eat food. And there are a lot of things to love about ourselves, but we don't have to earn it. I'm not coming to this saying, you know, I'm a girl boss and <laughs> I've, I've figured it all out, you know. I'm still trying. One of the reasons I believe I deserve love is because my amazing mom sacrificed everything to have and raise me. I deserve love just because I exist. I 
deserve love just because. So do you, and so does everyone outside these walls. But I still do harbor a lot of anger. I still deal with depression. And I still have a lot of anger on behalf of the women who came before me. And so I've had to find other ways to deal with that, just besides standing in front of a mirror and saying to myself, I love you. So as a musician, I've set out to create music that gives people time and space to find some love for themselves. I started writing a record in, well, I don't know when I could say I started writing it, but I made a record in 2020 with my band, which is called Youth in a Roman Field. And Youth in a Roman Field is sometimes just me, like today. Um, and the reason it's called Youth in a Roman Field is because when I studied abroad in Rome as a, I guess, senior in college, I was really dealing with my first wave of depression. And I saw a young girl twirling around in a field when I was walking home from my class. And it struck me because she had such joy. And I thought about that joy and what brings me that joy, and it's music. So I'm trying. I'm trying by looking in the mirror and saying to myself, I love you. I'm trying through my music, and I'm trying in my everyday actions. <laughs> The record I started writing to give myself some healing and give myself some space to find love comes out in two weeks, and it's called Get Caught Trying, and I'm going to play a couple of my favorite songs from it now. I 
Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to play one more, and it's actually um, not something I think I have ever played live, perhaps. <laughs> um, it's the last track on the upcoming record, which is called Get Caught Trying. And I wrote it for and about my mom and her experience in the world and it is called Get Caught Drawing.
my type, crying or pain. A miss take up a lot of space. Lost my type in an endless rage. The myths are barely band-aids. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Like my mother and my grandmother before me. Where is the gap in my memory? Stare her down And along with her The ones who made that crowd Ooh. Ooh Like my mother And my grandmother before me Where is the gap In my memory Since the end is up to me, I'll tell her she never earned a seat. The longer I listen, the more I've seen. I know I'm hers and she has set me free. She has set me free. She has set me free. saved by you she wouldn't want me to I can't rely on you she wouldn't want me to Thank you all so much. Thank you for having me.